Hi, my name is Joe Evinger, and I help coordinate the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group presentations. All of our members here at Ashby Village have varied education and work experience backgrounds, but we all share one common thing, in, and that is that we have a great interest in science and new ideas. We currently have over 50 members in our group, plus another 50 on our guest invitation list. We meet the second Thursday of every month at three o'clock. Presentations last roughly 45 minutes to an hour, plus another half an hour or so for questions and answers. We have a different guest each month who speaks on a topic related to science and ideas. We rely on our group members, arts and the Ashby Village Arts and Cultural Committee, general Ashby Village members, our invitees, presenters, whoever, to uh, help us find new speakers. Besides our presentation today, I'm actively recruiting speakers who might speak to us in the coming months. I already have a speaker for next month. It is a retired astronomer. Uh, he will speak to us about the discoveries uh, made by the new James Webb Space Telescope that was launched several minutes ago, uh, several months ago. We invite all Ashby Village members to join our group. We invite people from the general public and other uh, villages to uh, join our group. But right now I'm going to introduce Lou Feldman. And Lou Feldman is the, uh, excuse me, is the director of the UC Botanical Gardens and also a lecturer at Cal Berkeley. Uh, subsequently, he joined the faculty at the uh, in his career at the uh, Department of Biology, now called the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology, where he has spent his entire academic career as a professor of plant biology. He is a plant developmental biologist and for his research has focused on root development. He remains involved in teaching and has served uh, as a longtime instructor at Berkeley's large introductory bio biology class, which with over 750 students. His main thrust as director of the UC Botanical Gardens is to ensure that plant collections are curated and well-managed, which involves raising funds to maintain and update the facilities for caring of the plants. Additionally, he works to promote garden activities and conservation okay. education and research. Today, he's going to talk about growing plants for food and research in space. He will add a bit of science to the talk and about how plants translate the physical signal of gravity or lack thereof into developmental processes and responses. With all of that long introduction, I would like to introduce and thank uh, Dr. Lewis Feldman for speaking to us today. Lou, you have the uh, controls. Okay, here. Let's see if this is gonna work. Do you have something? Can you see? Not yet. Really? Um, what do you see? <laughs> we are still seeing the regular Zoom screen for everybody. Okay, so let's see here why we're not, maybe I have to put share screen, we'll give this a try. And if this works here. Susan sees you. How is this? Do you see anything now? Not quite yet. Uh, wait a minute, here we there go. There it is. Do you see the full screen or you don't see this thing in front, do you? <laughs> no. We just... Okay, you're all set? Everybody can see it? Yes. yes. All right, yeah. very good. So uh, first of all, thank you, Hillary and Joe, for inviting me. Uh, today, what I'd like to do is to talk about something which uh, perhaps many of you think of as science fiction, uh, but in fact, it's uh, happening today and it involves uh, the colonization it will involve colonization of other planets and maybe beyond our, our own solar system. But before we do that, uh, we need to establish uh, some ground rules. And those are involved in my case, how to grow plants because plants are going to be foods. And as you'll see, they're also going to be involved in many other of the activities uh, when we eventually go off planet. So I begin with this slide uh, from uh, the movie, The Martian. Uh, and uh, it looks like it's science fiction, uh, but it's real. And uh, what I'd like to do is to begin with a quote uh, from the 
uh, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, who died not too long ago. Hawking actually said that uh, he felt humans only had about a thousand years left of viable existence on our planet, and that if we don't leave Earth and uh, colonize other planets, that humanity is doomed. And uh, this is a prediction which he said may seem kind of gloomy, but he views that the thousand years that we have before we'll really face this crisis will allow humans to develop uh, mechanisms for uh, going off planet. And uh, that is if we can make it to other planets. Uh, what I wanna do today then is to talk about space biology, which has as its objective to put humans on other solar bodies, including moons and planets, and also how we make these planets habitable for humans uh, to live on. And this is a process which I'll talk about at the end, which also sounds very science fictiony, which is called terraforming. And we'll refer back to terraforming at the end of the talk today. Uh, but the objectives of, of going to other planets or other moons and uh, developing a human culture there really uh, have to depend upon a number of activities which have to precede it. And the two activities that I want to talk about today are studies of the effects of microgravity, that is uh, living in space on plant development, which is where I have done my research. And the other aspect, which I know many of you are interested in, is how we can uh, grow uh, food, namely plant food, in space off planet uh, for a human existence. And keep in mind that if we're going to go to other planets, that for much of the time, we're going to be traveling in space uh, for long periods of time, perhaps years, to get to other planets. And uh, humans are going to have to live in this microgravity environment before we get to these new places where we might be living. Now, to start this talk, what I want to remind everybody of is that all life on Earth, uh, going back to when the Earth first formed uh, about 4.3 billion years ago, all life developed with the presence of gravity. That is, uh, in some cases, the gravity may be 1G, maybe slightly less than 1G, but living organisms have come to depend upon gravity always existing. And as a result of the fact that gravity already ex always exists, organisms have developed to take advantage of this uh, signal, the stimulus, which is always around. And plants in particular have evolved to use gravity as a cue uh, in many of the aspects in their development in their environment. And what I'd like to do today is to talk about uh, some of the ways in which plants have used gravity um, and then how the absence of gravity uh, may upset these cues, may upset plant development. And I'll begin with this slide here. This is a seedling, probably a bean seedling, which has been put into the soil and uh, doesn't see any light. It's maybe buried a couple of inches below the soil. And yet when the seed germinates, the shoot system grows up and the root system grows down. And the question is, how does this occur? And uh, what are the mechanisms which are allowing it to occur? And the answer in a very simple way is that plants through evolution have evolved mechanisms for detecting the gravitational vector and orienting their growth, in this case, a growth which allows the shoot to grow up toward the light and the root system to grow down into the soil to anchor the plant and to absorb water and nutrients. Now, for people who study uh, gravity or gravity translation, uh, both on Earth and more importantly in uh, microgravity, that is off planet, for example, at the space station, the plant which is mostly used for that work is a plant which is known as cress, or the common name is Arabidopsis thaliana. And this plant is used for many experiments because it's a small plant, you can grow many of them. It uh, grows very quickly, it has a very quick life cycle. And uh, the plant, you can see the flowers up at the top here, flowers when it's relatively small and completes its life cycle perhaps in less than 50 days. Also, this plant has uh, used, you can get flowers on it and the flowers will produce fruits and also the fruits will make many seeds. So the plant has a relatively quick completion of its life cycle. The other advantage of this plant, which makes it useful in trying to understand gravity or microgravity in space is this is a, a square Petri dish. And on this square Petri dish, we can grow a large number of these plants and you can see both the shoot systems and the root systems. The root systems in this particular case grow down because this plant is grown here on earth and the shoot systems grow up. So what I'd like to do today is to talk to you about uh, how does the plant detect gravity? How might the signal be changed in uh, the environment of the space station or on a spaceship going to uh, a distant planet? 
And for this talk, I'd like to mm -hmm. focus on how the root grows down. And I'd like to call your attention to the very tip of the root, where we're going to focus for our discussion today on how plants translate the gravity signal. So here is a sequence of three corn seedlings which have been germinated. The seedlings were oriented differently uh, in these three different pictures here. And notice in all cases that the root system grows down. It is detecting the gravity vector and it is orienting itself to grow down. And ultimately, as you can see here, the shoot system, irrespective of the seed orientation, the shoot system grows upwards. What I'd like to do now is to focus on the tip of the root system, which is uh, the organism that, or the part of the organism that I'd like to talk about with regard to understanding how gravity is perceived and then how the signal is translated. And in particular, I wanna draw your attention to the very tip of the root here, which is shown in an anatomical sort of diagram over here. This structure is known as a root cap. And uh, for those of you who may have read some of Darwin's works, he and his son Francis published a book called uh, The Power of Movement in Plants. And he believed, or he didn't believe, but he suggested that the root cap was really the brain of the root. And the reason it's the brain of the root, according to his idea, is if you look more closely at the root cap, there are a series of cells which are magnified in these other drawings here. And in these particular cells, they have a large number of starch grains, which are given the name amyloplasts. And these starch grains, always rest on whatever is the lower surface of the cell. And Darwin and others found that these starch grains are heavy, heavier than all the other portions inside the cell. And they, as a result, sediment to the lower surface of the cell following the gravitational vector. What is particularly important about these starch grains is this is the orientation we had before. If you change the orientation of the plant to the horizontal, the starch grains, because they're heavier, will now be displaced to what turns out to be the new lower surface of the cell, which contains the starch grains. And with time, the starch grains will uh, distribute themselves on the lower surface and end up at the lower surface. It is this repositioning of the starch grains, which is telling the root that its orientation in relation to gravity has changed. And these starch grains move not because of any input of energy, but because of a gravitational vector. It is the movement of these starch grains which are gravity controlled and which tell the root which way is down and which way is up. Subsequently, if we allow this root to grow, now that's detected the new gravitational vector, it will grow out and eventually grow downward. So here you can see a real live root. Here are the starch grains which have been stained. And this is the orientation of this particular root here. But if you now change the orientation 90 degrees, these heavy starch grains will sediment to the new lower surface and tell the root that its orientation with respect to gravity has changed. Here are some of those Arabidopsis plants in a square Petri dish growing here on earth in a 1G environment. Notice that the roots are growing downward and they're growing downward because the starch grains or the amyloplasts as they're called are now located on the lower surface of each of those cells that I mentioned in the root cap. Here are now some Arabidopsis plants which have been grown in the space station. And this is a sequence, a time sequence, in which we have seeds on the Petri dish. They're allowed to germinate in the microgravity and the space station environment and allowed to grow. And what you notice is that the roots, rather than all growing down, grow in many different directions. They are no longer able to perceive gravity. The starch grains no longer sediment in a uniformly downward way. And as, a set, and as a result, the roots grow in a random fashion. This can be seen with corn as well. In this particular case, uh, this, was, this is in one of the space stations, uh, STS, uh, one of the space missions, and also in the space station. The roots grow in very different directions. Some of them are growing horizontally. Some of them are growing up. Some may be growing down just by chance. So in the absence of gravity, the ability for roots to orient themselves is lost. And the question is, is this detrimental uh, to uh, being able to grow plants ultimately for food and space? We'll talk about this a bit more. The other question uh, which people ask is in this root cap over here where the starch grains normally sediment is what other chemical interactions, biochemical interactions are affected as a result of uh, the absence of gravity? We're gonna talk about that shortly. 
The other question which people ask with regard to growing plants and, plants and microgravity is, can a plant complete its life cycle in a microgravity environment? You've seen that the roots grow in all kinds of unusual directions, but can the plant develop in the absence of a 1G environment? In space, there is some gravity, but it's very, very much reduced compared to what it is here on Earth. So here we have uh, a number of Arabidopsis plants. Some of them obviously didn't grow. And the question is, can they complete their life cycle? And in fact, that does happen. These plants growing in microgravity can complete their life cycle, although their orientation of their axes is frequently upset. So we can get in space what's known as a seed to seed life cycle occurring in the absence of a strong 1G gravitational vector. And this is very important fact to know uh, in order for us to think about growing plants in space to say nothing about growing them on other planets. So, Plants are likely to make up a large portion of the bioregenerative support system of plant of, of, uh, of humans. And it's going to be important that we able to grow them for these very long duration space flights. Space really does represent, space flight represents a very stressful environment. And one of the ways in which biologists are studying this stress is to actually ask, as I implied before, how are some of the important gene activities in the plant affected as a result of being put into a microgravity environment. This is a plant which is known as Brachiopodium in which uh, investigators have grown it in on uh, the space station and in a microgravity environment. And then while still in the microgravity environment, the plants, plants are, are harvested and frozen and then are brought back to earth. And there are uh, control plants exactly the same age which have been kept on earth. And both of the plants then are sequenced as far as their gene expression patterns to ask what's different about the gene expression pattern in space relative to what we have here in the ground control. And uh, this can be done also with Arabidopsis. And there are large databases which have now been produced and which show a large number of genes which have been affected in their expression when the plant is put into a microgravity or micro G environment. The point that I want to make to you is that plants still will grow in space, although there are going to be changes in their development uh, as expressed by changes in the pattern of gene expression. Here is Arabidopsis. The same thing can be done with Arabidopsis. The seedlings can be grown in space, and then before the uh, space shuttle returns to Earth, the material is harvested and frozen, and then back here on planet Earth are analyzed genetically. Another aspect of growing uh, plants in space is illustrated by these trees here. Again, the shoot system is growing up because it's detecting gravity through a very similar mechanism that we have in the root system. But the point I wanna focus on here is that this large shoot system of these trees is able to develop and the tree is able to support itself because of a compound known as lignin. Lignin strengthens cells and allows massive structures like trees to be supported. And the question is, uh, in the absence of gravity, and you saw some of those pictures we had before, what happens to lignin? This has been one of the first experiments that plant biologists actually did in the space station. And what is found, and this is a very simple growth chamber on the space station, is that in fact, in growing plants in space, the amount of lignin, that is the amount of material which uh, reinforces the walls and makes them stronger, actually is decreased. The plant doesn't need lignin because it's in a micro-G environment. And as well, the uh, lignin content decreases. And as an aside, I want to mention to some of you who may be aware of this, that when the astronauts go into space, they lose about 20 to 30% of their bone mass. Again, uh, it's not lignin, it's another substance. But in both cases, the absence of a gravitational force or gravitational pull results in the gene patterns expressing themselves in such a way as to make less of a structure that you really don't need in this uh, microgravity environment. In addition to um, the direction of gravity, if we're gonna grow plants in space, there are many other features and factors that we have to consider. And you can see some of them here, the carbon dioxide content, the water quality, the temperature, the light, all of these uh, factors have had to been researched before we can actually grow plants successfully in space, especially on long flights. And the way we do this is by developing uh, space gardens, as you see over here, 
which are given uh, various names. This one is called the vegetable production system or the veggie system. And the very first ones which were developed were about the size of a suitcase and had plants uh, in a sort of clay pots. And in the clay pot, there was a material in which the seed was embedded before the plants were sent into space. Keep in mind that when we're in space, water is not necessarily going to go down because there is no longer a down. And the nutrients and you normally find in the soil are not going to be distributed in a very common way that you find here on Earth. So we're going to talk about how investigators have been, looked at what happens to water in the environment. And this vegetable production system or veggie system, as it was known, is the first attempt of plant biologists to look at what happens when various environmental factors that plants normally have here on Earth are altered as they are in space. In the veggie system, which has been now replaced by more advanced ones, which we'll talk about, uh, different types of plants have been grown successfully, including Chinese cabbage, uh, Mizuno of mustard, Russian kale, and zinnia flowers. Uh, some of you may know the astronaut Scott Kelly. Uh, he was actually able to grow zinnia flowers in space and was able to pick a bouquet of these flowers, uh, which I don't have here, and to get them to grow. And one of the things I want to say to you is that when you talk to the astronauts, and I've had an opportunity to speak with a few of them, uh, the, the absence of um, pets or some kind of a hobby really turns out to be something that they miss greatly. And for many of the astronauts, being able to grow a plant, especially a plant which makes flowers, turns out to be uh, something that they look forward to. And uh, they check it every morning, as perhaps many of you do when you go out into your own gardens. And for them, it turns out to be an important aspect. It's having something else living with them on this long flight, uh, aside from other human beings. So although this may look pretty and it may seem to be trivial, it in fact, emotionally and psychologically, as it turns out, has a, a great benefit uh, for the astronaut crew. The veggie habitat has been replaced by something which is known as the advanced ha plant habitat. And uh, this advanced plant habitat is different uh, and because biologists can now measure and control many of the parameters which were sort of more randomly controlled in the veggie habitat. We can control the light, the temperature, the moisture. There are, in this case, uh, 180 sensors. And uh, this allows us to be able to understand in more detail uh, how to grow plants in microgravity and how to grow plants to complete their life cycles in order to provide food uh, for the astronauts. And uh, this, uh, advanced plant habitat, which is shown in this slide here, has a large number of sensors. We're able to change the color of the light, able to alter the atmosphere, and importantly, able to alter the water supply and the nutrient supply to these plants. And at the same time, we're measuring it. Now, these habitats are, as you will see, small, and they are used now for research. Uh, they're not obviously going to be used uh, only for growing food, uh, for long duration space flights. Here is one of the astronauts who's been very interested in understanding water movement in the materials in which the plants are growing. And as I said, this is a important aspect because water uh, has no downward direction to go. And so how does water get distributed? How does it move in a microgravity environment for the long space flight? And how does that affect how the plant is able to develop? Uh, here's another astronaut, Jessica Meyer, with uh, materials which are known as water pillows in which she was growing mustard greens. And again, she is interested in understanding how water moves, how do the roots uh, get to the water, and uh, how does the water actually get absorbed uh, by the root system. So although this may seem like a very simple and trivial topic, uh, obviously getting moisture to the plants is a really important uh, aspect of being successful at growing them in, in space. So in addition to focusing on the basic biology in plants of, in space, uh, there are other aspects that we wanted to talk about. And one of them, which I mentioned was the emotional and the psychological value uh, with regard to, uh, in the case I showed you, the zinnia flowers before. Now, uh, as humans grow into, go into space, they're going to be uh, need to have supplemental food. Right now, we know that many of the packaged diets which are used in the space station uh, over time, in relatively short time, decay many of the vitamins and the uh, nutritional quality of the foods which are sent up are, are lost. 
And uh, anecdotal evidence also suggests, and many of you can agree with this, that uh, plants which are living and fresh um, make uh, have psychological benefits for people who are uh, in long time visitors on the space station. So what I wanna do is, is briefly talk to you about growing these new food plants in space. I've already mentioned to you a couple of them that have been done. These are the ones which have been mostly focused on now, lettuce, kale, uh, bok choy, uh, mustard, and romaine lettuce. Notice that most of these are green leafy plants and uh, that's because these seem to grow most easily and also provide a great deal of nutrition and satisfaction to the astronauts. These are grown uh, regularly in the veggie production system. And in fact, people have sampled uh, these plants in their systems. I'll show you some pictures of them. Here is a uh, Peggy Whiston harvesting uh, some plants in the space station, a type of cabbage. Uh, these came from the veggie habitat. She's putting them in plastic bags. Some will be sent back to uh, earth itself to be analyzed, but others of them, you can see they're really beautiful. Others of them, they're very proud being able to grow them. And I have to repeat again, how psychologically and emotionally satisfying this is to the astronauts to be able to grow their own food in space. Uh, there is a great deal of nutritional value. And uh, what has been done is that astronauts actually are tasting some of the plants they grow. And uh, at the same time, there are those same plants growing here on planet earth. They're tasting them for flavor, texture, and, and so forth, tenderness. And uh, these are evaluated. And as you might guess are important psychological benefits uh, to living in the space environment. Here's one of the astronauts, uh, Shane Kimbrough, very proud of these uh, particular plants of romaine lettuce that he's growing here. And here they're actually sampling and tasting some of the plants, uh, which is regularly done on the space station, even though uh, right now, uh, most of the plants are supposed to be sent back to planet Earth for analysis of nutritional content. Uh, these are some really beautiful mustard plants, again, grown in the, uh, the habitat that I showed you a picture of before. And uh, they are used again to assess how good the habitat is, how good the control of the environmental factors. And as I said before, uh, really being able to see these plants affects the morale and the mood of the astronauts. There are some radish plants here. Radish, as you know, are one of the easiest plants to grow and were one of the first plants grown on the space station uh, and also will probably be grown uh, one on long-term flights. Uh, here are, they're growing very well. And uh, here's one of the astronauts, they've taken off the green tops. You can see how large they are. They're probably not beautiful like you'd buy at Berkeley Bowl, but they are certainly edible. Uh, here they are at a close up. Uh, notice that the condition of the chamber is such to be able to monitor many activities and the water and nutrients are provided by a very specialized system because what you're looking at in radish is really a root system. And this root system has to be able to absorb moisture. So we can't just water them with a sprinkling can and think that things would grow well. Uh, here are some plants, uh, reducci and some lettuce. Uh, you can see them growing here in this chamber, grow very well, again, a leafy crop. And this gives people a lot of hope that uh, we would be able to supply food for our own selves as we travel these great distances to other planets. Um, here is uh, just a, an example of how people can use plants not only for foods, but there are hopes that the plants will provide medicines or other compounds uh, that may in fact be useful uh, over on long distance flights and certainly will be useful when we land on other planets and we no longer have access to fresh drugs. We will probably bring plants along which we know produce these drugs so that we can actually have a supply of them. Uh, here is one of the gardener missions. Again, I want you to notice everybody is smiling. Everybody is happy when they're doing that. Notice the light regime which we have here. The light regime has been altered and can be altered in many ways. And again, to provide uh, the best light for growing different plants. And this has been one of the research topics uh, which the astronauts have explored in, in the space station. This is a cartoon. This is an idea of what one might be able to do in a space station once you get the uh, proper conditions for growing plants. And I'll show you a picture of one that they propose for uh, planet Mars, for example. So the last uh, topic that I wanna talk about with regard to uh, the usefulness of plants on the space station has to do with microalgae. Although the algae are often overlooked as important organisms, they, for food, for example, they actually can be uh, very important in producing the food 
And more importantly, uh, for our work, they actually are important in renewing the atmosphere of the plant, uh, of the whole space station, actually. And what I want to talk to you about is something to show you how important microalgae can be. And this picture over here shows you that in this case, we've called it an algal reactor. Algae absorb the CO2, which is uh, in the cabin air. Uh, they can also be fed the urine in, uh, from you, you individuals. And uh, they then uh, can convert uh, that material into new cabin air to return to the cabin and also into algal biomass. And they can actually treat the water and uh, purify it. So algae are now being looked at, microalgae are now being looked at as uh, potential plant passengers to take along and to develop uh, in lifestyles for in the space station and for long-term trips. Here is a really interesting experiment. There are some microalgae and a group of organisms that some of you may be familiar with known as cyanobacteria. Both of these organisms are photosynthetic. Both of them uh, take carbon dioxide and can make biomass and also purify the CO2 to make uh, breathing air. And in this particular case, the uh, algae were put into containers to keep them alive and were put uh, for two years outside the space station uh, in the environment of the outside. And they both lived for a long time when they're brought back in. So these are very hardy organisms. Uh, they are able to be transported great distances and then be brought back to life and to perform the activities that I talked about before. Here is a, a, this algae, this one particularly, some of you may have heard if you're a health addict, addict this is called spirulina. Uh, this has been grown in these sort of uh, environments here where they're given light, CO2 is bubbled through this chamber and then the algae grow and can be harvested. And in this particular case, the spirulina has a very high protein content, four grams, uh, plus it provides many, many antioxidants and this is one of the microalgae which is being considered as a food on long uh, trips into space. It's, it's very hardy, as I showed you in the previous slide. Now what I want to do is to take you back to planet Earth and to tell you a little bit about some of the ways in which we're trying to involve students in they're going to be the next generation of individuals who go onto the space station. Uh, this is a company in Berkeley called Magnitude IO. Uh, they produce a small growth chamber. And this growth chamber has uh, lights in it. It measures temperature, CO2, water. It's got a camera in it. And plants are put into this growth chamber. It's about uh, maybe 12 inches high and about five or six inches across. And high school students, or maybe even elementary school students, join this program and have one of these chambers for them uh, to put plants in in their high school classrooms. And this chamber, as I said, controls temperature, humidity. It has Wi-Fi. And uh, at the same time, this chamber is in the high school classroom. The exact same chamber is up on the space station. And here we have one of these chambers where we have uh, nutritional media. We have two different wavelengths of light illuminating the seeds which have been put here, which are then either brought to the high school classroom or an exact duplicate chamber is sent up into the space station. And here you can see some students here examining their plant inside the chamber. And the idea is to try and have the students understand what are the differences in the growth patterns of the plants in Earth compared to the exact same chamber on the space station. And for these experiments, these students actually have Wi-Fi. They get data, which is downloaded frequently from the space station, and are able to compare the pictures and the growth patterns to the plants they have in their high school classes. Here is a view in the space station of one of these chambers, or actually there are two chambers which have been placed in here. And again, the data is uh, streamed down to the high school classroom and the kids are able to compare it to their plant that they have growing in their own rooms. Uh, here are some of the plants that you might see growing in one of these chambers. In this particular case, it was space, obviously. The plants are growing horizontally. And uh, here are some of the plants which have been grown in this chamber. And these are the space missions in which these chambers have been sent up and uh, where students then are able to uh, compare what they see in their classroom to what goes on in the actual flights. And finally, I just wanna end with a topic that I touched on earlier, which was terraforming. Uh, that is uh, converting an environment, a planet which is not hospitable to us into an environment which might be. 
Um, one of the simple ways of terraforming is not to do much to the planet, but to introduce uh, growth chambers, which take advantage of the light, perhaps of the temperature, and allow plants to be grown outside in the Martian environment. And here we have uh, uh, types of growth chambers which have been proposed uh, with plants inside of them. Obviously, these plants need oxygen, they need CO2, and the environment in Mars itself or another planet uh, may not be suitable just to open the window as we have here. Here is a picture from the movie uh, where Matt Damon stars in, as the Martian. And again, here is an environment where it's self-contained, where we have oxygen and CO2, moisture, soil, and where the plants are growing. But the real objective would be not to have chambers, but to actually be able to grow organisms outside uh, in the natural environment. And in order for this to happen, uh, we have to terraform the new environment that we go to. And by definition, terraforming is transforming a planet or a body so that it resembles the earth, especially so that it can support human life, and in this case, plant life. And when we talk about terraforming, the planet which first comes to mind right now and which is an objective for much of the space research which is going on is Mars. And Mars has great similarities to Earth. We believe it once had a thicker atmosphere, that it had flowing water on its surface, and that, believe it or not, we think that there's still plenty of water available on Mars beneath its surface. Uh, it has uh, diurnal activity, seasonal activity, as, as we have here on Earth. Its uh, rotation is 24 hours and 40 minutes, pretty similar to ours. So there are many features about Mars which make it uh, suitable for us to consider as an environment that we might want to think about moving to, but that depends upon terraforming. Notice that the atmosphere of Mars today is 96% carbon dioxide. Uh, there is uh, no oxygen. And so we have some of these other gases and earth nitrogen is one of the prime makeup of our atmosphere. So if we were to terraform a planet, this is an artist's view of terraforming it. Uh, questions, there are questions on how you would do it. We won't talk about the technicalities, but here is a sequence of events which would eventually result in a planet or a body uh, which has uh, characteristics which will allow humans and plants, in this particular case, the green background to grow outside. Here is, an, uh, again, an artist's view, uh, but it's something which people are actually thinking about. How would you terraform? It is science fiction now, but, but it's, it, people are thinking of how might might do it. And beyond uh, the inner solar system, uh, there are other places that we might think about terraforming. And those places in particular include uh, the moons around Jupiter and Saturn. And these are very attractive places in part because there's a lot of ammonia and methane a large number of carbon-based compounds that are already there. And it is believed that there is frozen water uh, beneath the surface of some of these uh, moons. So I would expect to see in the future, and I know there are uh, ex explorations now going on to look more closely at these outer moons in part, just because they're interesting, but also in part for us to perhaps colonize in many, many uh, years from now. So this just shows you some of the possible moons of uh, both Jupiter and Saturn, and also Uranus, which is quite far out, that one might think of colonizing. Notice that uh, in many cases, the moons of Jupiter are about the same or slightly larger than Earth, which would suggest something about the gravitational field and would also be uh, one perhaps more suitable. Europa is high in people's minds as a planet, or really in this particular case, a moon, which has so many similarities to Earth uh, that it's exciting to think about whether this might be a potential place uh, for, for terraforming, if that were possible. So I'm going to end with this slide over here just to show you that what I've talked about, although may seem to be science fiction, in fact, yearly, there are symposiums on the International Space Station in which these very topics that we've talked about today are widely discussed. And even today, there are plant experiments going on in the space station with the ultimate goal of being able to grow human food in space and uh, have a way of reproducing the food that we need for space flight, which may take several years. And as I mentioned before, as well as being able to regenerate the atmosphere and to purify the water, which will have to be reused uh, by the astronauts on the space station. So I, I've talked about something where there are real experiments which are going on today. But much of what I've mentioned is probably 
uh, fantasy at this point, uh, but it's fantasy based in fact and fantasy based on experiments, which are ongoing now. And the fantasy will change as we gather more data. And perhaps the fantasy won't be fantasy anymore uh, once we are really successful, at, at least in this particular case, making a habitable long-term uh, space flight to a planet like Mars. So with that, I'm gonna stop and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. And if any of you have any questions or concerns, uh, please let me know. So let me open it up for questions. Do we have any questions at this point? Anybody wanna to go to Mars? <laughs> <laughs> Well, look, I'll just start things off to, maybe to encourage people to ask other questions. What, 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 are there plants that grow anywhere near the surface area uh, that's not ice of Antarctica, for instance? Any kind of life there? Yeah, there, there are, and certainly um, there, there are, there are, of course, there are no plants that we know of on, on Mars or any of the other planets, but there are plants that will grow uh, in very hospitable hostile environments. And uh, many of the algae, for example, if any of you have ever hiked up to the top of Mount Lassen uh, when there was snow, there is a pink alga that actually grows in the snow on the top of Mount Lassen, an environment that you might think of as not being uh, very conducive to growth. So the answer is yes. I think uh, choosing plants, especially microalgae, where people are beginning to look more closely, uh, will open uh, many opportunities that are probably limited with uh, the things like lettuce and mustard. The reason I ask that is some of the warmest temperatures uh, in, in Antarctica, aren't they vaguely the same as some of the warmest temperatures on Mars? Yeah, you're right. And that's exactly right. And the Mars can get very warm and also very cold. And, and then that, the experiments really where those, uh, I showed you the space station with the cyanobacteria and the algae growing out or kept in, in packets outside the space station, those plants experience a great change in the temperature between day and night. And so they still survive. So the answer is probably microorganisms are going to be uh, the ones that we really need to think about more developing. Right. Oh, nice. um, delicious. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question out there. Oh, yeah, they are. They are. Do you bring anything? Well, my um, Sally has a question. I just wanted to ask if Dr. Feldman is willing to give me some contact information. I have something I want to send to him. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. <laughs> yes. Do you want to buy email or is it going to be something like? The email would be best because it's yeah. an attachment. Yeah. Oh, great. It's, it's just ljfeldman at berkeley.edu. At berkeley. .edu. I'll look forward to it. Okay, I think you'll find it amusing. Probably. <laughs> Good. Uh, I was wondering how a science teacher, either elementary or middle high school, would be would apply to become part of that exo lab program. Yeah. Uh, so that you you buy into it. Uh, I think I don't. Know, it's not a great amount of money, but I think if you look on it's it's magnitude io, and they have a web page. And you actually can find their web page, uh, and they're they're available. And you you imagine for kids, it's very exciting because uh, when I was at a recent one of these uh, meetings that I have here posted on the last slide, that it so, so happens that uh, the space station was passing over the meeting at a particular time in the afternoon, and there were kids from high school who were there. And they had a chance to ask the astronauts any questions they wanted. And I remember one, one boy asked the astronaut, did he frequently bump his head on the space station? And the astronaut said, yes, he did. So the kid was very happy. That's great. Uh, Sarah has a question. Well, I had several questions, Lou, as you talked and you've answered all of them. But I have, I have a more personal question and that is, um, would would you be dying to go to the space station yourself? No, I have trouble going home at night. Okay, so um, <laughs> so given that, given that, um, but I what... must say, let me just say, I do have a lot of colleagues who, given the state of the planet Earth right now, would be glad to go to Mars or the space station one way. 
<laughs> yes, I can imagine. But I'm also looking as we are seeing these fabulous pictures of from James Webb of the moons and of some of these planets that you know are indeed very far away. But um, as we are learning more and more, um, this your area of expertise here is really opening up. Yes, it's going to be. And in fact, kids are really interested in their very, um, I think right now they're drawn into it by the technology. And what I'm trying to do is to draw them in to the biology, because the technology is really going to be useful, but the biology has to be the end product for them. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I think Alan has a question. It's on the chat. Does anybody looking at that? <laughs> Well, say it can, yourself. I yeah. can ask it now. Yeah. Where's the food? All of this is green leafies yes. and the whole world and certainly our uh, culture has misequated food with leafies with the color green. I don't know why the color green is there. There's a whole question also about using energy and the, the sun shines on Mars. There's a lot of biological and theoretical and technical questions, but are what are they going to grow and how are they going to manage the carbon? Are they yeah. going to process the breath of the people or are, <laughs> or, or are they going to store carbon, which can be stored as a solid rather than a gas? I mean, uh, this is what people need to make our hands move and our mouths move. Right, so, I mean, obviously, as I mentioned in the microalgae slide, the whole notion would be is the algae would capture the CO2 and convert it into biomass, which we would then <laughs> consume, and it would be recycled uh, again and okay. again. Is but, it digestible biomass? Yeah, it is digestible. The spirulina yeah, is very digestible. But okay. they're also, uh, although I didn't show it here, they're also, it started out with attempts, they used to grow grains, rice, uh, some wheat in some of these chambers. They turned out to be not good plants to uh, use for experiments because they had too long of a life cycle and they were uh, too big. So right mm -hmm. now we appreciate what you're saying, which is that we can't live solely on green matter. We need to have uh, other types of foods. And so they are developing other varieties or thinking of using other varieties, which will have faster life cycles or be much shorter as far as uh, their size so they can be grown in the habitat on the space station. Now, I appreciate the grains as not being eligible, uh, <laughs> but I'm looking for a balance of proteins, fats, and yeah. starch sugars, which I'm sure you are and they are too. Yeah. Because there's, in addition to a greenophilia, there's also a lot of proteinophilia. That's and, right. Uh, and well, you know, this is if you know the biology of the plants, but the public, the people, and the schools, the people who are studying this in high schools, uh, are going to be uh, conditioned by public images if we don't, I don't know even if we can change that because there are reasons for the public images, which is my thing, which I don't want to bring up now because it's, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm out in the space trying to deal with yours. <laughs> but uh, public images are very important. Yeah. They govern what money is allotted to what, et cetera. Yeah. Anyway, my question of where's the food still stands. Right. No. And I think that they're obviously going to, if they're going to do this, it's got to be a balanced diet of some way, you know, you're right. Well, I have another question about algae. Uh, it's been a half a century since I've taken biology class, but as I uh, remember, algae doesn't have roots. That's right. Roots didn't evolve until... Um, plants moved on to land, although there are some plants that move back into the water, but they're not algae, and they do have roots. And is that a particular advantage then? It... Well, it is, because the algae that are grown in space are basically very simple organisms. They're often single cells, or, or they are filaments. And so it's much easier, because they have a large surface area, to get uh, absorption of nutrients or carbon dioxide, because you have a large surface area to take that, and also to produce oxygen via photosynthesis. So you mentioned that some plants grow more easily than others. I think yeah. you said radishes, for instance. Yeah. Of the subset of all plants that are easy to grow on Earth, are some of them easier to grow on the space station than the others? And might not that be a clue to... Yes, yes. and that was the basis for selecting those plants that were actually grown initially uh, on the space station is 
which are the ones that grow more easily, quicker, provide more biomass on Earth. Yeah. No, I mean, no, no, no one suggested avocados or kiwi fruits, anything like that. <laughs> well, the avocados have fat. They do. <laughs> and that's, that's important too. It is. But uh, also plant matter, biomass is a big turn. And if the green leafies actually have a lot of plant matter in them, and if we could digest, in other words, chemically convert the cellulose, which is interesting how cows and sheep do it, more yes. complicated than we would think. Yeah. Uh, but that becomes a very primary thing. Grow the green leafies, but eat them for their caloric content after whatever we do with our, our plenty of solar energy, I guess, uh, how we manage it. Yeah, yeah. We had a speaker a few months ago, Lou, uh, who was also a biologist, who was very concerned about deep sea mining. Yes. So there are uh, various lithium and other. Yes. Uh, uh, and he talked about what the what is going on 6,000 feet below the surface. And there is still life down there. Oh, yeah. growing. Yeah. And there's no light at 6,000 feet. So I'm just trying to think through what we might learn from the kind of life that lives at 6,000 feet and how that might adapt. Yeah, well, m much of the life, or if there is life down there, it often uh, it has a different type of um, uh, source of energy. Uh, obviously, light doesn't go that down that far, so it can't use light. But the the the, the vents, the steam vents that have been down there, uh, the sulfur vents, there are other ways of metabolism for gaining energy, uh, and that certainly is a way. It's a clue for us to think about other forms of life on other planets, um, which might take advantage. For example, I said that uh, the moons of, uh, of Jupiter, there's a large amount of methane uh, there, but it's a carbon-based compound, which potentially could provide a food source. Mm -hmm. And one of those moons, I think it's Uranus, uh, it has a sea underneath it. Yes, that's right, I do. The ice cap. Yep. So obviously there's no, no, can't much be if any light down in there. But it's still theorized that it could be conceivable that there could be life down there? Yes, I think so. Again, uh, we're kind of fixated on the fact that, with a few exceptions, that all life depends upon ultimately sunlight sequestering its energy in carbon bonds or in some type of uh, energy storage. Uh, and so we, we have that our point of view. But we do know that there's life which doesn't hear it down in the deep oceans near the vents, which don't depend upon uh, carbon. My understanding is that the life down there has no color. Is that true? I don't know. <laughs> you know, color it has I a lot of evolution. Yeah. I read that, but somewhere. Yeah, yeah I mean, color, color is wavelength. Yeah. Right. So, so, and the light down there is very low. However, and also we shouldn't forget that the solubility of gases is a function of both temperature and pressure. And for curiosity, look up the ice fish. There is such a thing called an ice fish. It lives just under the ice because the oxygen is highest there. Mm -hmm. wow. Interesting. A lot to learn. Yeah. No. <laughs> and a lot to unlearn. <laughs> so uh, one thing I've learned um, um, among many things in this presentation is that Things can grow with basically zero gravity or almost. Yes, gravity. that's right. Mm -hmm. no, that, that, and that's been a very important point to come out to space biology research is that, um, uh, and, and as I mentioned there, what we're also finding is there are a lot of similarities. For example, I mentioned the starch grains being uh, used in detecting the gravitational vector. Although humans, we have in our ears something called otoliths, which are calcium sulfate bodies which actually tell us when we're up or down our equilibrium. So we're learning about a lot of, we reach the same endpoint in many different organisms by different pathways, uh, but we're able to orient ourselves to the gravitational mm. field at the end point. Mm. You know, and in, in, in hearing, talking about gravity, I can't, I start thinking about centrifuges. Mm -hmm. You know, and you maybe can see where I'm going with this. Yeah. I mean, if a space station rotates fast enough, you're, right. you're 
Any thoughts on that? Well, what they have done actually, uh, Joe, is and it's, it sounds kind of contradictory. They actually have sent centrifuges up uh, to the space station so that they can centrifuge things at 1G to see if they do grow differently, is it only based on huh. gravity or is there something else which is missing uh, that we're, we're missing ourselves? Like uh, maybe they're more cosmic rays and that's why the plants look different. It has nothing to do with the absence of gravity. Ms. Sarah? Um, I'm going back to the radishes um, uh, because I do like radishes, but also I'm really curious, how good does this stuff taste that's been- I, being I haven't talked to the astronauts about that, but I do know that they uh, enjoy eating it. Yeah, but I can't tell you, I'm sure we could find a paper on it, on the, you know, the, the, the tastefulness or the palatability. I'll, I'll see what I can do for you, actually. That's a good question. You have some salt or whatever, but- Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> some salad dressing, uh, vinegar and oil. But um, seriously, I think that um, we're, we're pretty picky eaters at this phase of our development. And I think that as Alan was saying too, we want a little more than just uh, a leafy green. So yeah, but keep in mind, mm -hmm. you can't run down to the corner store when you're right. <laughs> you have to bring it with you. <laughs> that's right. Or you got to make do with what you've got. That's right. or, or grow it. Or grow it exactly. Well, that's your point. There yeah, is, yeah. and that's an energy question. And I don't I think the sun helps. Yeah, a warm well, whatever. I was sun. involved also in Antarctica, and they build structures and grow things much more like we would up here. Yes, because that's it works. Yeah, and they have gravity in yeah. space. You that's that's what you opened up. You made me think of gravi gravitationless. And it's, it's a good slide. The three little thingies with yes. up down. Some, I also something better grow some Tabasco sauces. Go along with it all. <laughs> oh, that, that's that's taste. That has nothing to do with, with the efficiency of growing. No, Although it is, necessary. of course, why we choose our foods. One mm -hmm. of the many reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have any other questions for Lou at this point? If not, uh, Lou, thank you very much. A, a two-time presenter, <laughs> you should get some kind of special uh, award. But thank I, you for thank your you. presentation today. I, I appreciate being asked, and it's always fun to talk about gravity. Uh, <laughs> and, and how do you it's, distinguish it's not, it's it? Really, it's really something we don't think about enough. Uh, it's important. It really, it really is. Uh, it's always here, and so we just assume. But it, but it does so much for us. So, Try magnetism. Yeah, magnetism too. Same thing. Exactly right. That's. Thank you again. Hey, again, okay. thank you very thank you. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So long. <clears throat>